tonight. So Proverbs 10 tonight. Proverbs 10. Are you enjoying the study in the book of Proverbs? All right. So uh, Solomon has laid for us, as, as he's been going through, and, and a, a, a gospel foundation. And I, I, I see that in every book of the Bible. There's a gospel foundation. There's a picture of, of redemption. There's a, picture, a prophetic picture of Christ. Solomon has laid for us a gospel foundation, showing us that the first step on the journey to wisdom is to live in the fear of a holy God who judges sin. Amen? Yeah, that's the first step. Having instructed us now in the blessings and the joy of wisdom and righteousness, having instructed us in the cursing and the misery of foolishness and wickedness, having shown us uh, wisdom personified, wisdom personified in two ways. Uh, he, he has shown us wisdom personified as Christ in the throne room and leaving behind his high exalted position as master craftsman there in the throne room with the Father, daily his Father's delight, yet he leaves behind that high position and he makes his delight among the sons of men in this inhabited world. That is Christ coming down from heaven. Wisdom is personified in Christ here in the book of Proverbs. And what wiser thing can we do than to come to Christ? Amen? That's, that's the wisest thing we can do. And then wisdom is also personified. Solomon has personified wisdom as a very wise woman who speaks excellent things. The wise woman who take her, took, took, takes her place, takes her stand on the high hill beside the way where the paths meet. It's a very busy place. And I believe this hill is Golgotha. And this wise woman proclaims her very wise message. And I believe it's the gospel message. And I believe this wise woman is the church. I believe that wisdom is personified in Proverbs 8 and 9 as Christ and His church. And so that's the foundation. And all this, Solomon has laid a gospel foundation for us in the book of Proverbs. And now he's building on that foundation, right? We have to come to Christ. Other foundation can no one lay, but that which is laid. We can't build on a foundation of our goodness or our wisdom. We can only build on the foundation with God's wisdom once we know Christ, when we're on the foundation. He said that, Upon this rock, I'll build my church. He wasn't talking about Peter. He was talking about himself. Upon this rock, I will build my church, he said to Peter. He was talking about himself. Now he's building on this foundation, this gospel foundation, with these short little proverbs. We, we, you know, we, we were looking at things that just kind of themes that took us all the way through the chapter. Now we're looking at short little proverbs. And that's why we're kind of taking it at a different pace. We're, we're not rushing through this. We're, we're taking this a little bit at a time. But these little proverbs are loaded with godly wisdom. That They warn us. They teach us how to have joy. They show us how we ought to live. They teach us how to be blessed. These are wonderful proverbs. And so we're not racing through any of this very fast because we want to take in everything God intends for us to receive out of this. So we've already examined verses 1 through 15 of Proverbs 10. Now we're going to take it back up tonight, beginning in verse 16. So let's look at Proverbs 10, verse 16. And listen to this verse. It says, The labor of the righteous leads to life, the wages of the wicked to sin. Why don't we pray? Lord, tonight we ask you to bless our study of your word. That you'd make these words just come alive off the page. You've taught us, Lord, that your word is sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing to the dividing asunder of the joints and the marrow, the soul and the spirit. And Lord, we would ask you to take your sharp sword of your word and operate on our hearts tonight that you'd do your will in us. 
that you would teach us that we might live for you and be blessed, Lord, and we might have life. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The labor of the righteous leads to life, the wages of the wicked to sin. This is an interesting proverb because Solomon makes sure that we have to kind of do some thinking to understand this one. Notice the word wages here. When uh, it's translated from the Hebrew word tebuwa, tebuwa, which means increase or produce. It can mean either one, increase uh, or produce. Most of the time when we see it in the Bible, tebuwa in the original Hebrew form, most of the time it's translated fruit. Here the New King James translates it wages. We usually think about wages as the income you earn from the work you do. You get your wages, right? Anybody just do your taxes? Anybody? Oh, I hope we're not in trouble. Nobody's raising your hand. Okay. God bless both of you who did your taxes. Um, we think about wages as the income that we earn from the work we do or simply what you earn from the things you do. But I don't think wages, as we see it in the New King James, I don't think it's the, the best uh, translation of this word in this case because the context in the verse itself speaks of how the things you choose to do in your life are going to bring about or produce a certain result. It's going to bring forth a certain kind of fruit. In a sense, wages will work, but I think fruit is a clearer thing. I think the King James renders this verse better. So I'm going to read it to you out of the authorized King James. Verse 16 says, The labor of the righteous tendeth to life. And I like that word tendeth even better than I like the word leads. It tendeth to life. The fruit of the wicked to sin. The fruit of the wicked, and you can, the, the tendeth is implied from the first part of the verse. The, the labor of the righteous tendeth to life. The fruit of the wicked tendeth to sin. Now, when we see that word righteous, we've talked about this to some extent. We've, we've, we've talked about the meaning of righteousness. And when we see it in the Bible, everything about the word righteous, everything about the meaning has to do with the root word, which is what? Right. Good. A plus. Right. Are your heart and your life right before God? Are you right and righteous when it comes to truth? Or, or have you been deceived and, and fallen for lies? Are you right and righteous in your behavior and your deeds? And when we speak of biblical righteousness... Remember, we can't treat it like, well, we're doing pretty good or we're doing better than we used to do. When we speak of biblical righteousness, remember, it has to be absolutely perfect, right? Absolutely. I'm absolutely perfectly right about that. It has to be. We're not talking about man's standard we're talking about God's standard, and His standard is always absolute perfection and holiness. No sin, no flaw, no mistake whatsoever. Absolute perfect. So, are we 100% right? Are we 100% righteous in all we believe and all we do? Well, we know. <laughs> Brother Bob's back there shaking his head, <laughs> right? And I don't know if he's talking about himself or me. <laughs> we know because of sin, right? And all of us, right, have that problem. Because of sin, we're not. We know like Isaiah, the prophet, testifies in Isaiah 64. All, he says, I like the way he says it, all, we are all like an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses, right, so all the things that you can listen and say, I'm righteous in this, I'm righteous in this, I'm, I'm, I'm righteous in this, all our righteousnesses 
are like filthy rags. That's what he compares our righteousness. We are unrighteous sinners who need to be saved by a compassionate God because we don't have any righteousness of our own. That's, that's the truth we come to when we read God's Word. That's the truth we come to understand. The good thing for us, the good news is, we do have a compassionate God. Amen? We have a, a compassionate God who saves. And the way He chose to save, the way God chose to save, is to make an exchange. God chose to save us by making an exchange. He would take our sins upon Himself. God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, would take our sins upon Himself so He could bear the penalty of them for us in our place. And then He, in exchange, would place His perfect righteousness upon us as a gift. That's the exchange that was made. Nobody ever got a better deal than what we got when Christ took our sin and He gave us His righteousness, right? That's a good deal, isn't it? Right? He took our sin and got all the curse of it and bore it all. We get His righteousness and we get all the blessing and eternal life and forgiveness of it. Amen? That's great, great for us. Let me say it like this. He makes us fit for heaven by taking our sin unto Himself and giving us His righteousness. So when we think about ourselves as righteous people, we understand that it can only be because we've been made righteous. It's, it's a judicial thing. Our gracious, almighty judge has declared us righteous by giving us the righteousness of His Son. So, in light of that knowledge, that knowledge of what true righteousness means to us, in light of that, let's talk about what this verse means for uh, those of us who've been made righteous. Let's also talk about what this verse means for those who are wicked, who've not, for those who have not been made righteous because they don't have faith in Christ. Let's talk about what it means for both. So verse 16, the labor, and I'm still reading it in the King James Version, the labor of the righteous tendeth to life, the fruit of the wicked to sin. As is the case in so many of Solomon's Proverbs that we have uh, looked at, that we've studied, we have two paths laid out before us. First, we see the path of the man who's saved because Jesus has made him righteous. And what must he do? What must he do? He must labor. He must labor. The saved man has been made righteous. Now that he's been made righteous, he must labor. Now, he's not been made righteousness because of his labor. But now that he's been made righteousness... But now that he's been made righteous, he must labor. He can labor now. He could not even labor, do anything good before he was saved. But now he's saved. Now he's righteous. He can work. He can labor. He must work at doing righteous deeds. The man who's been made righteous must work at doing righteous deeds. Now, let me say this to you. That doesn't come natural for us. For us to do righteous deeds, even in our redeemed condition, we tend to gravitate back to our old unrighteous ways. So we have to work at doing the kind of righteous deeds which tend to life, blessing, and joy and all the rewards of living your life in the wisdom of obedience to God. Did you know that God is a rewarder? God's a God who rewards. And, and you can't really please Him if you don't believe that. Did you know that? Because it tells us in Hebrews, in chapter 11 and verse 6, Without faith 
It's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, right? You've got to believe that God exists, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, right? And I think the, the greatest reward is that when we seek him, we find him. He is our reward. He's a rewarder. But you can't be a lazy Christian that's sinful. Now, I, I know, I understand as I talk about this, we can do Nothing in our own power. But once God gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit, the powerful presence of the Almighty God Himself living within us, He expects us to work at doing righteous works that will glorify His name. That's one of the reasons He saved us. One of the big reasons... He saved us. The Bible tells us that in Ephesians chapter 2. You know, that so many people quote Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. They said that we're not saved by works. You know, uh, that we're, we're saved by grace through faith, not of works. We're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. But Ephesians 2 and verse 10 goes on and it says, We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works that were before ordained that we should walk in them. So that's uh, one of the reasons God saved us. As, as saved people who've been made righteous by the gift of God through the cleansing of the precious blood of Jesus, we must work to act righteous. It, it doesn't come natural for us. It will be labor for us because it is not in our nature. Everything in our fleshly nature fights. And Paul tells us the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary to one another so that you cannot do the things that you want to do, that you would do. Right? It's not in our nature. Everything in our flesh fights against us doing righteous things. Everything in our fleshly nature tends towards sinful things. I mean... Understand what Solomon's showing us here. Our natural moral tendencies, which, which we were born with, okay? Our natural moral tendencies, which we were born with, lead us to sinful behavior, okay? That's what we were born with. But our unnatural moral tendency, which we have been born again with, Right? When we're born again, something happens, right? Our unnatural tendency, our moral tendencies, which we have been born again with, lead us to righteous, godly behavior. That's why we're told here in this proverb, the fruit of the wicked tendeth to sin. That is, when you follow the desires of of your natural moral tendencies that you were born with. If you just do what you kind of desire to do and you've desired to do all your life, if you just do that, the natural tendency we were born with always leads us to do the easiest thing. The easiest thing. But if we want to walk in the way of blessing and life, we need to make the hard choices that are not natural to us. So that's why it's work. That's why it's labor. Okay? Are you with me? Okay? That's why it's labor for us to choose the path of obedience to the Lord. The natural tendency, so let me, let me say it like this. The natural tendency of most people is to sleep in late. Right? That's kind of what we want to do, right? That's, we, we kind of want to just keep on sleeping. Uh, we know we ought to get up. The alarm goes off. We hit that snooze, you know, and just, just five more minutes, you know, and then 15 times we hit that snooze button and it stops working. I don't understand what happened. I only hit it 15 times. Because it's the easiest, it's our natural tendency to sleep in late because it's the easiest thing to do in the moment, right? But it takes work to do the right thing, to drag ourselves out of bed and get going, right? 
that takes work. If we stay there and do what's natural and easiest for us, it's going to produce the sinful behavior of laziness, slothfulness, right? How long will you slumber, O sluggard? Right? Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, right? If we do what's natural for us, it will produce the sin of laziness. And so you have to work, okay? That's a choice we have to make every morning, right? Am I going to lay in bed and be lazy? Am I going to get up and work like God wants me to do? That's the first choice we have to make each day. But it's only the first choice. There's a hundred more choices that we have to make after that. Whether we're going to do what's right or whether we're going to do what we naturally tend toward. Right? we got to work. There are a hundred more times each day you're going to have the opportunity to choose the easy path you want to walk or choose the hard path of righteous obedience to the Lord that He wants you to walk. And that takes work, church. That takes work. It takes no effort at all to sit on the couch and watch all the junk on the TV. Anybody watch that award show the other night where they were worshiping Satan? And where the people at CBS said, we're ready to worship with you? I didn't watch it, but I, I, I heard about it. That was one of the big Hollywood award shows. What was the one that they just showed? Grammys or something like that. Or They, they, had, one of, uh, they had some people that were up there performing and they were very out in the open about the fact that they were you know transgender which is not really a thing scientifically it's just some dude dressing up like a woman or some woman dressing like a dude they haven't crossed genders still the same chromosomes in their body just dressing different okay because they can't get their mind off anything else but their loins okay and they're dressed up like the devil, dressed up like Satan, and people all around them bowing down, worshiping them. And the people at CBS said, we're ready to worship the devil with you. No problem. It's not funny to me. It's sick. They're not even hiding the Satanism anymore. And Beyonce, she's always been a Satan worshiper, a witch. Um, and, 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 but they're not hiding it. It's out in the open now. But it takes no effort to sit down and watch that junk. Just sit there and watch that TV. But it takes work to get up and pray. It takes labor to get up and pray and read God's Word and go to your job and faithfully and honestly do the work that you've been assigned to do. And when you make those wise, righteous choices, it's rewarding and it leads to prosperity and it leads to blessing, and it leads to joy, and it leads to life. So the labor of the righteous, do you see how it tendeth to life? Right? You have to work at it. You've been made righteous by Christ, but then you have to work at it, and when you, do the, you choose to take the hard path and do the right things, it tendeth toward joy and blessing and life, right? But the fruit of the wicked to sin. It takes no effort at all to let your mind wander in the sinful lusts of this wicked world, right? It's so easy to start thinking about that. But it takes work for us to keep our minds pure, keep our minds fixed on Jesus. That's what God wants us to do because He wants us to experience life and blessing and joy. So the fruit of the wicked leads to sin, tendeth towards sin. Now let's look at our next proverb, okay, real quickly. Um, this one's in verse 17. He who keeps instruction is in the way of life. And again, you got the labor of the righteous leads to life. And here you have another thing that leads to life. He who keeps instruction is in the way of life. But he who refuses correction goes astray. About 15 years ago, it became very popular uh, to, for people to buy a little device called GPS, right? Global Positioning System, right? 
a device that goes in your car. But these days, just about every one of us has one of those built in to our phones, right? The technology our children are growing up with was the stuff of science fiction movies when I was a kid, right? We used to watch the guys on Star Trek. They'd flip that thing out, Kirk to Enterprise. We used to carry a little piece of cardboard around with, and we'd flip it open, Kirk to Enterprise. Spock. Jim, I'm a doctor. <laughs> we would just go back and forth and talk to each other, and we, you know, we would beam each other up, you know. <laughs> and we, the stuff that, you know, we don't have the beaming up thing yet going on. And I still don't understand how you can fax something, you know, <laughs> but. You put it in the machine over here and it goes over to somebody else's house. I don't know. But we don't have a fax anymore, so that's obsolete. I'm still amazed at that old technology. The stuff that kids are growing up with is something else. Let me tell you about the Stone Age. Back before the development of GPS, which my dad gave me one that he had that, well, you know, you used to have to buy newer ones, but now they kind of update automatically and all that. And, um, but he gave me an old one and I used it for a little while. Before the development of GPS, if we were traveling locally, we would depend on a paper map that you unfolded, right? And you're looking for the thing. If you lived in a very, very big city, you know, we used a MAPSCO. And so you had to find the right page and you had to find the right square on the grid to find the street you're looking for. And so that was kind of a good way to try to find it. If we were going on a long distance trip, you had to use a ridiculously big book about this big called a road atlas with maps of all the 50 states. You know, and my, every, every dad probably had one of those in his trunk, you know, if, if, you, if you traveled very much, which I also inherited, I think, dad's atlas when he handed down his GPS. You know, he always gives me his old stuff. All those ancient methods of cartography, um, were designed and produced from pictures that are taken from way up high in the sky, from helicopters, from, from planes. Eventually, as we've already you know, talked about, we've advanced to satellite imagery. That's how the GPS works. It takes a picture from up in space and tells you where you are. The point is, the higher up you're looking down from the more you know and understand where you're going right the higher up you're looking down from the better understanding you have of where everybody's going in other words the one who sees from the highest vantage point the highest position has the best directions right right who can see everything from a higher position than God right we're down here we think we got it all figured out we don't think we need anybody to tell us anything and God gives us the directions and he can see from way up there and he knows where we need to go we think well God I think I need to go this way it's really good we've come so far in our ability to find direction because many a marriage has come to a very bad place out on an unfamiliar country road with some husband you know gripping tight leaning in close to the windshield and telling his wife just calm down I don't need to stop and ask anybody for directions you know it's never a, a pretty picture some people think they have it all figured out in their pride they don't think anybody should tell them anything or they need to hear anything from anybody they think they know where they're going but wouldn't the journey be so much easier wouldn't life be so much more rewarding if we would just listen to the wisdom of the one who sees from the highest vantage point of all amen he knows where we need to go he knows how we need to get there so listen to him he who keeps instruction, he who humbles himself enough to say, okay, God, I need you to show me where I'm going. 
He who keeps instruction is in the way of life. But he who refuses correction goes astray. Now that idea of going astray, it's like that of a sheep who gets separated from who? A shepherd, right? We need our shepherd. And the sheep gets lost. Poor, foolish, ignorant, stupid sheep who has no idea where he's going. He will most certainly, without a doubt, perish out there in the wilderness without his shepherd. Do you know what the sheep do when they get scared? When they get hungry, when they can't find food, do you know what they do when they get thirsty and they can't find water? When they get thirsty and they can't find water that's still, right? If it's got waves in it, they're too scared to drink out of it because they think an uh, alligator is going to jump out and eat them. And that's why the Bible says that he leads me beside the still waters. If they fall in a ditch and can't get out, what do they do? They cry. A cry of a frightened sheep is the lunch bell for a hungry lion or a wolf, a coyote. Point is, you refuse to listen to the instruction of your shepherd. If you go astray from the presence of your shepherd, you're in danger by being destroy, of being destroyed by your, as Peter says, your adversary, the devil, who walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Right? But did you know our Lord Jesus is the good shepherd? Right? He's the good shepherd. Isaiah 53, verse 6, tells us, all we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. I think we know where we're going, don't we? We've all done it. We've all done it. But even so, he is the good shepherd who left heaven behind to come down into this world to seek and save those like you and me who were lost. Jesus, the good shepherd, said this, John chapter 10, I lay my life down for the sheep. So, he's not only wise, he's not only the one who sees from the best vantage point and can tell us where we need to go, but he's also the most loving, right? He also loves you with the greatest love and he would never take you in a bad direction. He who keeps instruction is in the way of life. Listen to the voice of your shepherd, right? Listen to him, follow him. But he who refuses correction goes astray. Please listen to me tonight. Every one of us needs to forsake all the foolish pride that would say, I know where I'm going. I don't need anybody to lead me. We need to humble ourselves in the presence of our good shepherd. Who, by the way, is the almighty God who knows all things. Listen to his voice and follow him. Amen.